Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a couple of seconds while everyone comes in. Hopefully everyone's having a wonderful Wednesday. It's the middle of the week, almost to the weekend. Good morning again, everyone. My name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the SBDC or Small Business Development Center. I'm joined today with my fabulous colleague, Lori Williams. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Lauren. And I'm going to take a minute to a shout out to Lauren. Everybody that joins these shows knows that she is the genius behind the chat. Uh, I tell you, I get the chat afterwards and I think, oh my God, she is managing a whole lot that's going on. So this is a big thank you. And uh, we couldn't do it without you, Lauren. Oh, thank you, Lori. Super sweet of you. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Get this party started. All right, everyone, good morning again. I know there are a few of you that are still filing into the room, but I'm going to go ahead and do a quick intro. Again, my name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. The SBDC is a national program with over a thousand locations across the country. So regardless of what city you might be in, you will have the opportunity to get in contact with a local SBDC office. And SBDC offices offer no cost services for local small businesses. And they're no cost because your tax dollars have already taken care of the, um, any charges. So they are your tax dollars at work. For the Los Angeles network, which is the network that I represent, we have several locations, which you can see here. We go as far out as Camarillo, over to Santa Clarita, Pasadena, down to Long Beach, and everywhere in between. So again, um, if you're looking for any small uh, business resources, please, please get in contact with us. Here's a deeper dive as to what it is that we offer. No cost business advising. And so you have the opportunity to connect with experts in various fields like finance. Um, and you can speak to Lori Williams or one of her colleagues, as well as marketing, social media, you name it, we've got it. And again, it's free to you. And then we also offer virtual trainings. So similar to what you're attending today. Again, all for free. So we're here to help. Be sure to get in contact with us. For the Los Angeles area, the number is 866-588-7232. Or you can hit us online. Uh, it's smallbizla.org forward slash new client. And for those of you outside of the Los Angeles area, it's americasspdc.org forward slash find your SBDC. With that, Lori, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share. Now stop my screen share <laughs> and do a quick some uh, housekeeping. And so for those of you who are new to our show, please be sure to put any questions into our Q&A. Again, questions in the Q&A as Lori will be monitoring. I wanna be sure that no one's putting any questions into the chat because she will not see those as quickly. And a quick good morning to our frequent flyers like Emma Green, good morning, Emma. And then to you, Annette, good morning to you as well. And then Lori, good morning to you again. I'm good excited morning. to be a part of the show. We got another exciting one coming up, Lauren. So guys, let me just get us kicked off a little bit here. Um, so what I wanted to discuss today before we get started Oh, let me get this going. There it goes. Um, so hold on. Okay. So I want to give you a preview for next week. So first of all, kind of a housekeeping, as Lauren says, I believe anybody who sent in a question or a request, I've gotten to everybody. If I have not, please send it in. Lauren will put her email address in the chat many times, as you know. Also, keep in mind, if you want to be a guest on the show, send in and let us know. I can send you a form to fill out and talk about you possibly being a guest. I don't think I talk about that enough. Um, and if you have questions during the time that we have the show. I try to address as many as I can. If there are questions that are maybe too involved for the show, I do try to get back with you afterwards. And for those who reached out to me and we've met one-on-one, -on -one, that's been fabulous too. I love to meet you in person and be able to help you accordingly. So before I get 
to introducing our guest today, I want to talk about what we're going to do next week. I am going to elaborate once again, we're going to have an Ask Lori, Learn From Lori session. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to elaborate on something I started speaking last week. And the reason being is I got such an interest in this topic. And I started out talking about the four um, questions that every single business owner should be able to answer, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this a little bit further. And what I'm trying to do in essence is help you to become your own CFO. Obviously, small companies can't afford CFOs. So you, guess what? You are the CFO. So instead of thinking all about just finance being um, that I have a cat that's like walking in the middle of See, Babu, say hi, Babu. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, guys. I've been Zoom bombed by my cat. Um, so for many of you, you think about your financials as just filling out a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet if you do and getting your taxes done. What I'm saying is that it is not enough. What you want to do is internally be able to assess your numbers and understand your financial health. Your financial health needs to be understood when you're healthy and when you're having financial troubles because what it does is it gives you more choices. So next week, we're gonna have a session. Once again, you, you know, questions in advance, questions questions during the Q&A. I'm going to really address some things on your mind and the underlining subject matter that I'm going to discuss is I'm going to say financially speaking, you got to understand where have you been, where are you now, and where are you heading. And this is about making assumptions about your finances. This is considerations and concerns and choices, and in some case, actions that you must take. Without having these proper numbers in place, you don't have a roadmap to know where you're going. So if there was one goal that I have for every small business out there is to have a better understanding of how to manage your company financially. And so we're going to get into depth about that next week. And with that being said, this week is really an introduction to someone who learned what I'm going to speak about and learned it very well. She is going to share your story. So I'm very excited to introduce Michelle Davis. Michelle Davis's company is Giggle STEM. She is going to tell you about her company. She's going to tell you about what happened um, during COVID. And I can assure you guys that after listening to Michelle's story, you're not only going to come away with a better understanding of why I am so adamant about knowing where you are financially, but really what's going to be important is um, learning that there's a tomorrow and what can happen when the worst thing happens. So first of all, I want to say, Michelle, thank you for joining us today. It is so good to see you on the show today. Hi, Lori. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here and share my story. Wonderful. So, you know, in order to tell your story, what we really have to do is we got to go back pre-COVID because the story really started before COVID. And so I think we started talking maybe three or four months before COVID. It wasn't a long time, I don't think. I don't remember. Everything's kind of blur. But I remember that, you know, you were just in the process of doing some things when I met you and it was committing, notice guys, I said the word committing, committing to long-term expenses, including a business lease. You were going forth with your company and then um, things happened. So tell us first, let's go back to that point in time. What was going on? What was your company? Where in your mind at the time, Michelle, were you heading? Yeah, that seems like a lifetime ago. Um, it was definitely different times. Um, I had I had opened an indoor playground in Long Beach, and we offered a co-working space for parents. You could drop in if you needed childcare for your children. Um, we did birthday parties. We did all kinds of things. And I think at the point that Lori, you and I were introduced, I was probably twelve months in to my initial lease, about there. And um, at the time, I had a surprise pregnancy. I had all of these things that had happened that I did not plan on happening in my first year of business, right? Um, and so I had a lot of hiccups. I had a lot of things that just didn't go as planned. And enter Lori. Um, it was like they knew I needed to meet you. Um, I was, you know, talking about financial wellness and financial health. I think I was teetering on that edge of being like financially 
unhealthy um, and not for lack of vision, not for lack of drive, just it was just circumstances that I didn't think about as as a new business owner. There were things that I didn't think about um, expenses that came up and, um, you know, I wasn't wise enough to know in advance. Um, so at the time, I was really trying to find ways to bring in different forms of revenue um, at the brick and mortar location. So we were thought, talking about doing things like summer camps. We were talking about, you know, um, incorporating just some more options and more ideas and seeing where we could take what we had and just kind of compound on it to have more offerings to support the community, um, but also to really, you know, bring our numbers so we could stay in the black. That's that's where we were at the time. And then, you know, what I remember is when COVID hit, we started realizing really when the lockdown started, it was when the lockdown started, because of course the play center came in under the lockdown. And I remember that there was a time period. Now this, I don't recall the amount of time you maybe will, but Michelle, you were trying to hang in there. You were trying to figure out how to be able to pay the lease, pay the expenses, do what you could. Um, you were just, you know, we didn't know what tomorrow would bring. So of course you were trying to hang on, but also you were at the point where you just weren't at a belief that it was going to have to change. We were trying to hold on. What was going on in your head? I mean, that's where I see a lot of people, whether it's COVID, whether it's because things didn't turn out. I mean, this I've seen for 30 years of my business life as a consultant with people in that state of position in their mind. Um, to, I'm not going to say anymore, just take us into your <laughs> yes. emotions at that time. Emotions were high. I mean, I think I think for everybody, emotions were high. We didn't know what was going on. We were told, oh, this lockdown is going to be two weeks. Well, hey, anybody can survive two weeks being closed as a business, right? We'll make it work. And then as we all know, two weeks turned into two months, turned into six months. And I think for me, I was frustrated. I was in a position to where I felt like if my business failed, I was failing my family, not just in a way that was, um, oh, you know, personal pride, but financially, you know, I had, we had, you know, Lori, we went through this. It was like, do I go bankrupt? Do I, do I try and get out of my lease? Do I, you know, what do I do here? Because I'm, I'm not able to be open. I'm not bringing any revenue in. I'm digging this hole of this lease of this sp beautiful space that I can't even use. You know, I tried selling, we tried doing the online classes. We tried doing, you know, um, we tried doing classes via Zoom and, you know, these were geared towards younger children. And I, I know everyone went to Zoom at that time, but for younger children, it's just not the same experience. And I could see how parents were giving up on that. Like, okay, this is not working. You know, younger children really need that in-person connection to stay focused and to really get something out of it. So that quickly fizzled. And I feel like after that, it was kind of just, what am I going to do? Because I'm, I've got bills, I'm digging a hole here and I have to get out from under this before it comes crashing down personally on my family. Um, so the pressure was, I mean, huge and three little ones at home. I mean, that's, that's all I could think about was how am I going to make sure that my family doesn't, you know, lose our home over this. Um, and, and I think the timeline you're asking about Lori is how long did I try and stick in there for? It was six months. Exactly. I gave it a full six months. And finally, I, I remember I was just, I had zero, zero wind in my sails. I was so <laughs> defeated. And I remember the conversation, Lori, you were like, okay, well, like, are you ready to face this? Are you ready to really to come to the idea that you may have to make a change that you don't want to. And that was one of the hardest conversations that I've ever had. There were tears, there was laughter, there was, I mean, any emotion you could feel. And I was on this roller coaster and, you know, um, my family was like, oh, well, we'll support you in whatever decision you make. But nobody really wanted to come out and say like, hey, the decision you should make is you need to close and get out of it. And Lori, you were the only person that said, look at these numbers, look at this spreadsheet. You have nowhere else to go. You're backed into a corner and you got to come out fighting. And that's what we did. Yeah. And, you know, to that, guys, just so you know, watching and I talk this about, I mean, you probably hear me say Excel data, Excel data so many times, but 
this is an example of where the Excel documents really are important because as Michelle was speaking, these are facts. They are definitely facts and they're intertwined with the emotions. Of course they would be, right? But when you take the data and I'm gonna show you a little bit about this way of doing it next week, we're gonna get into this next week. But when you take the data and you put it in Excel and you just drive some simple formulas, simple ones that anybody can do and you start putting in other numbers, you can say, okay, what is the probability of this happening? What is going to be um, the situation at the end? How much in debt am I going to be? When is that debt going to be paid off? And although, and I know this is a really hard one for most people to hear, although it would seem that the continuation and closure of businesses are emotional decisions, they are emotional, but they're not emotional decisions. And that's the difference. Their financial decisions and you know the old expression, the writings on the wall. And putting it in Excel gives you the ability to understand it or any type of program. It could be a pencil and paper. I should say calculating the data. I don't wanna say putting it in Excel. I should say getting the data down, aligning it properly and calculating. And what I always try to do is not tell people what to do because that's not the business I'm in, but show them. And so the conversation Michelle's talking with is where I, I think it was about a month of having you gather data, predict what the online could be, predict what this could be, look at your expenses, see what it would have to be, see how many more months you could stay closed. And it was becoming more self-evident every day. And you know, guys, I got to tell you, um, I was telling Michelle before we started, the conversation she's speaking of, I remember where I was. I remember how I was sitting. I remember the chair I was sitting in. I remember my heart just breaking because um, she was so upset and I, I knew it, you know, I'd worked with Michelle for how long and, you know, I knew where she was at, but I also knew something else. I knew that if we could just get the pressure off of her, some of these numbers, some of these finances away, if I could just get help to get that lifted, Michelle is a talented, brilliant, person and could pull something off. I just had to get that off. And so I kept saying to her, tomorrow could be better. Tomorrow could be better. We have to handle today. And one of my famous sayings as consulting, I always say delusional, delusional ignorance has never served anybody. Okay. So now that we are knowing and accepted, we can go forward. So we had that conversation. And then I, I think I, if I remember this correctly, I kind of said, Michelle, let's talk in a couple days and let's get a game plan. So then what happened next? <laughs> So a couple of days go by, I think I cried my eyes out for 48 hours. I went through all of the emotions, you know, um, angry relief, a little bit of relief to know that there was kind of like this light at the end of this very, very dark tunnel. Um, and from there, we just kind of started diving into what are my options? How can I survive this without the worst, you know, to me at that time, the worst possible Thing that could have happened to me was that I would have had to file personal bankruptcy and it would have affected my family. Um, my husband being a business owner of himself, you know, it would have affected his business. It had this domino effect. So um, I think, you know, next steps after that, we had another conversation and we said, well, let's try and get out of the lease and let's see what will happen. I mean, at this point, I couldn't pay them anyways. Um, you know, Lori, Lori knew that the, the, with, especially with the courts being closed, the bankruptcy, you know, that process is a lengthy one. So, you know, we kind of just gave, presented this to the landlord and um, <laughs> to say that they were, you know, not happy is probably an understatement, <laughs> but I, it was almost like they knew it was coming, you know? Um, and I don't, I don't even know that whole conversation to me is a blur because I think I was just holding my breath till the end, you know, to see what the reaction was going to be, because I knew if this didn't work, then the next option was going to be catastrophic. Um, so I don't know if it was just like the stars aligned or if it was just because we presented our case really strongly. I know that we worked on writing a letter. We worked on, you know, showing the financials. We wanted to really state that, hey, we don't have another option, but to get out of this lease. And here I was 18 months into a five-year lease. So you can imagine what that 
with that, you know, remaining. Yeah. Teams. And, you know, <laughs> I got to say that at that moment, um, so guys, I got to tell you some behind the scenes, Michelle became a perfect actress. Okay. <laughs> let me tell you why. So what I did is I had an understanding, like she said, that, you know, if they looked at the situation, especially where it was then, if she didn't pay and they went after her in the courts, it could take forever. And if she filed bankruptcy, there was no personal bankruptcy, there was no option for them to collect any money. So I decided, you know, the only negotiating tool was to give them some money as a payout, get them to rip up the lease and argue the point that you can hold stern because they were holding stern. They were not letting go on anything certified registered letter we were getting nowhere so I thought we had to back them in the corner but you know I in, in the SPDC I'm just an advising role I can't handle anything that's the role I play in that game so what I did is I wrote the words for Michelle <laughs> and Michelle spent the entire weekend her, her um going through the words and I remember she was rehearsing them and she told me that morning she said I remember that she probably don't even Michelle but you said I have given a lot of speeches I have never rehearsed and been so nervous because I told her you know these words you have to you have to have an expression on your face you can't say well then I'm just going to and be like this you know so I said you've got to have this expression right so we get in you know I she I said I can get on just as a person to help you to answer any questions on your finances that's the only part I could play. So I was just in the background on the call. It was a Zoom call. And the funny part I got to say is that she got done finishing the most powerful words and she's holding her breath. I'm holding my breath too. And we're both like, <gasps> and the gentleman on the phone literally screams, right? Michelle screams and says, hold on a minute, right? And we're both, oh my God. And he got up and he slammed the door, the window, and he said, I can't hear the garbage trucks out. So then he came down and he goes, fine, you know, I can see this. We'll rip up the lease. We'll accept your offer. But at that moment, we really didn't know what was going down. So obviously he was angry, but he just, and, and the point I'm trying to make about telling this in detail is it was the reason it turned around. It's we presented an argument where he knew he had no choice. That was his better option. And so when that happened, that was the great party, if you will, because it enabled you to get the money from the lease gone, but you still had loans, you still had other things, and then you had to clean it out, right? Yes. But once you cleaned it, you had like 30 days, they, they extended the time to let you clean it out than you had first, we had first offered. So now you're cleaning everything out, you're getting rid of everything. And then the next conversation, I'm just going to preempt it this way. Michelle, you had a clear mind. You got creative. You got real creative. What happened next? So I decided, like you said, I still had bills. I still had, you know, my startup loans. Those weren't going away. Um, and I needed to find a way to bring in some revenue. So what I decided to do was one of the things that we did there at in person was we did this STEM class, STEM meaning science, technology, engineering, and math. And the kids loved that class. It was super hands-on. They got to, you know, form gases and see balloons inflate. And they got to like, you know, see the volcano reactions and they loved it. And, um, I have, I have three kids of my own and my son at the time was like four and he was all about this. Um, so I decided, Hey, why not kind of, you know, everyone's home, everyone's quarantined. Kids are driving their parents nuts. I know mine were, um, why don't we make something and give this experience in a box so that kids can do this at home and it's it was something that you know i really i really felt strongly about i mean i i, I still wanted the essence of what i was trying to do in person to be conveyed to you know existing customers and then i realized well wait it doesn't have to just be my little long beach bubble we can ship you know, so we I, I I pivoted into doing STEM subscription boxes for kids or STEM kits for kids. Um, from there, you know, I started looking into charter schools and we became um, vendors, approved vendors for multiple charter schools. Um, you know, obviously we were on Amazon where we have our own website um, and it needed to be more than just a single product. I wanted to have a way that we could have recurring revenue, which is where the subscription came in. It was a way for, hey, I'll sign up and I'll, you know, I'll take a $5 discount or what have you. 
Um, and, and I'll do it on a recurring basis. Um, what I didn't realize at the time, Lori, was how much charter schools would actually become the bread and butter of what mm -hmm. we're doing. I had no idea. Um, and it's been great. And I'm going to continue to grow my efforts there, um, as well as, you know, a, a basic B to C e commerce strategy as well. That's that's always going to be you know on the forefront. But I had no idea that there was this kind of niche community that um, of homeschoolers that were looking for something like this. Um, and what I love about what I'm doing now is that I'm still giving an experience. I'm not selling a toy. I'm not selling a single product that you know you use it up once and you don't think about it again. Um, we're selling experiences for families. And that's why I still love what I do, even though this was so far from my original, you know, vision. I really love that I, I you know, we see customers posting videos and mom, dad, sister, brother, they're all getting around and they're all building the bottle rocket and watching it explode <laughs> outside, you know, and, and they're having this fun experience. And especially during COVID when everybody was home anyways, I feel like people were looking for non-screen opportunities, non-screen um, activities that yeah, they could okay. do with their kids that were different. Um, so that was yeah. my very big pivot. <laughs> yeah. So now here we're going to back up because I remember you know, another thing that was going on is I remember when we started talking about charter schools and I just by chance what during COVID I was traveling it hit I got um, stranded and ended up having to go to some friend's house who homeschooled their kids, right? So while I was there, they were like, can you set up a class for us? And then I realized how much they go online and they buy these courses to make sure their kids have all this. So we just started talking about it. So where I want to go now, Michelle, this is something that so many of our viewers and small businesses struggle with. You get a pivot, you get the idea, you can even create a product, but until you have a customer, you, you, haven't, you don't have anything, right? And and right. so can you get in the weeds detail as much as you could keep in mind, guys, I'm going to tell you, Michelle's got some skills in social media and marketing here. So, you know, elaborate on that. People really want to know, how did you get the customer? So you figured charter schools, did you call them? What did you do? How are you getting exposure of your product and spend as much time in detail as you can? Because that is a hot topic of our viewers all the time. Sure. So I think I started out, you know, I had I had this indoor playground and this very localized audience and I figured, you know what, that's my audience right now. Let's I'm going to start there. I'm going to start with what I have and I'm going to go from there. So emails, email blasts, um, sending out, you know, weekly emails to parents um, and, and showing them like, hey, these are this is what's in the box. You can't just show a box that's not fun right but finding a way to tell the story of what's inside that that is continues to be a challenge I, you know if, if i'm honest um and that will continue to evolve um social media that was it i mean social media and email those are the two ways especially in a world where we were shut down yeah it's not like anybody was going anywhere um people didn't even want to touch flyers that were on their doorstep because we didn't know if you could get COVID from touching something. So I didn't do any direct mail. I didn't do any of those traditional marketing methods. Rather, I just went all digital um, and SEOing my website. Um, and, and in this pivot, I really had to, I was going from Giggle Play, which was where the indoor playground was, but I needed, I needed something that stood for a STEM subscription box because Giggle Play, eh, it's, kind of relevant sort of, but it's not straight to the point. So I needed, in, in part of this was a complete rebranding, complete rebranding, everything from logo, um, changing my Instagram handles, my Facebook handles, um, getting a new URL on the website, completely redoing all of the keywords on the website, um, making sure I had a functioning shop on there. Um, you know, that was kind of like where I started was let's take what I have and again, part of the pivot, let's translate it over to what I'm doing so that I can reach more of that audience. And then past that, I started looking at, like we mentioned to the charter schools. And what I learned with charter schools is that because these are government funded programs, it's kind of like they either do it or they don't. So it's not like I can go market to, you know, the administrative team at the charter 
part of school and say, hey, I have this really cool thing. They will be like, yeah, that's great. But if they're not, you know, authorized by the government as a school educational entity to provide my box as part of their approved curriculum, then it wouldn't matter how much I impress them with what I'm doing. So for charter schools, it's a matter of you really have to do manual research. You have to look them all up. You have to go to their website, find out if they accept vendors, find out what their rules are around that. Uh, we're a materials vendor, not like an in-person or even a Zoom. So I'm not having direct contact with the children. So that's a little bit different. Um, so a, a very manual process, but that is how we start. And, and the other thing that we did from there was once I realized how many people were doing homeschool and how many people had joined charter schools, especially in response to COVID, people were pulling their children off of distance learning. And, you know, all of a sudden these homeschool charter schools were inundated with applications to the point where they were full of turning people away. Um, but I figured, well, you know what, those parents are also on social media. They're also probably on my email list. So let's talk about that. Let's let them know that we can become approved with their school. We can, they can use those funds um, to purchase this box. Um, so just kind of finding out where the audience lived and what's the easiest, most direct way to reach them. And that again was digital marketing. You know what I like about your story too, Michelle, and I'd like to really highlight this for the audience. You know, back in the olden days, I'm old enough to say the olden days, before anybody knew about social media and digital <laughs> marketing, we had to literally go someplace in some book, some resource, extract people's phone numbers, right, and call them on the phone. I remember back, okay, I'm 23, 24, when I had a company that was kind of becoming extinct without getting into the details on it. And I had to pivot and I know that I was going to try to call manufacturers. I had to go to the library and pull up the numbers and addresses of manufacturers and call them on the phone and ask them, right? So what happens is as soon as I'm saying that, everybody thinks, oh my God, that's so archaic. We don't do that anymore. Well, to a degree, you don't, but to a degree, and this is the part that I want to emphasize, sometimes, but more often than not, just a social media digital strategy does not suffice. If you're selling gumballs to a bunch of people, maybe, but if you're, your product or service has any type of customization to some specific market, a lot of times it takes exactly what Michelle said. She had to go find, she had to do the research, the legwork, find out if they could even purchase from her, then look up the schools, then contact the schools. So I um, just want to invite listeners to review your own type of product or service, review your strategy, and get away from, I don't like to talk to somebody, I don't feel comfortable making a phone call or something. Just take that little slice out for a second and, and do a little audit in terms because I see so many people that yes, they can sell some through digital, but at the least they have to call a distributor. You know, they have to call distributors to get in stores. So I think that that part was a really great aspect of sharing that it was not just all digital strategies. Did you run into any hurdles as you tried to start selling them that, you know, whether it was creating the product or trying to get enough people to purchase or people saying, no, I don't like it for this reason. Did you run into any kind of problems? Of course. <laughs> Anytime you're dealing with customers, you know, there's probably going to be some issues. Um, I would say from a fulfillment and standpoint, um, one of the biggest hurdles I had was actually getting my custom boxes here um in co during COVID times even i've done two two orders now of custom boxes and they get stuck on a ship in the ports and we're you know so i'm sending out this product that i'm positioning as this really great experience and it's more you know it's it's higher end but i'm sending it in like a plain white box that doesn't look high end that doesn't look fabulous because my boxes are sitting on a ship somewhere between here and China. Um, and it took me nine months to get my first shipment of boxes. Um, so that was a big challenge. I would say from a, from another challenge, just making sure packaging. So I fulfill all the boxes myself still currently. Um, so making sure that, hey, if I'm sending out something that's flour, let's say, or baking soda, 
we should probably double bag that. Or we should probably put it in a container that's not going to spill, even though in my head it's not going to spill. Apparently, you know, there's uh, transit companies that are not very gentle with things um, that can cause things to magically open and spill everywhere. Um, you know, that was a challenge. Um, finding an online e-commerce store that allowed for subscriptions was a challenge. There's a there's a ton of websites out there that allow for e-commerce, but not all of them allow for subscriptions. Good point. I never thought about that, Michelle. You're the first person that brought that up. If there's any resources for anybody else that's doing subscri subscriptions that you want to share, please do. And Lauren will stick that in the chat. We landed using a Wix.com site. Um, it's a you know it's a templated site. It's user friendly. It's friendly on the back end. It's design friendly. You know, like you mentioned, I'm in marketing and social media, but I'm not a web developer. Uh, I don't know code. Um, I, I that's not my wheelhouse. So I needed to find something that I didn't need to rely on somebody else to upkeep and to do. I needed to be able to do it myself, especially as a business starting out in this way. So we landed at Wix.com because they did allow for subscriptions. Um, there's some other options out there like Shopify. I think Woo is another one, but they don't allow for subscriptions. And those are great e-commerce platforms. Um, you know, we, you guys probably use them daily when you're buying stuff online and don't realize it. But um, I would say for subscriptions right now, we're using Wix. Um, and so far, I've been happy with it. Um, Amazon was another challenge. Okay, tell us about uh, that. So getting approved with Amazon, um, a couple things you can, if you're selling something on Amazon, like uh, let's say something that you can go pick up on any target shelf, I don't know, let's say a face cream or something. And that is a known brand, um, but your Amazon shop sells this item and it has a UPC code. You can go onto Amazon, apply to be a vendor and sell your item because it recognizes exactly what you have and what you are because you have a UPC code on this item. Okay. Now for someone who's making their own item that I don't have a UPC code system yet, um, you know, these aren't shelf ready products. So I kept running into issues and, and Amazon is not necessarily the easiest to work with. It took me probably six months to figure out what the heck I was doing on Amazon because I just kept getting denied. I didn't understand why I was getting denied until I finally, again, did some more research and found um, that they have a subscription box program. Perfect. You don't need a UPC code. Um, okay. it, it kind of eliminates a lot of the traditional products. You know, it's just a very different program designed for this purpose. Um, so once I figured that out, we became approved within like a few weeks and it was easy peasy, you know, but, but I, I didn't have the knowledge. This was my first time. Um, and I know there's a lot of companies out there now that you can actually go to for consulting on Amazon, if that's the route that you want to go. Um, and luckily I didn't, I didn't need to do that. Um, if I want to ever change my business model and go towards more of a UPC code type of thing. I probably will have to do that just because it's not my area of expertise at all. Um, but, you know, doing doing the research and even now our Amazon shop needs a lot of work. We're still working on it. You know, it's like an ever evolving thing that we're just trying to grow and grow and grow. I mean, we've only been doing this now for not even a year and a half. Yeah. So we're not even 18 months into this business plan or business model. So we're still learning. For sure. <laughs> but charter schools and the subscription model for charter schools is still your biggest revenue, right? It is. It is. That's and awesome. I, I, you know, I think that they, we have what they're looking for because it is educational. Sometimes saying it's educational is a turnoff to some people. They just think it's going to be boring. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, Michelle, you realize that you have a dream come true for everybody. You know, a subscription annuity business is ideal. And charter schools are continuing to have new students. So, you know, you know that is just remarkable. Now, Michelle, pricing. 
how did you come? I mean, you like you said, you're creating something new. I know there's some things out there. Um, you also have to consider all the packaging and the cost. Can you know that's the other thing that a lot of people in our audience, when they come up with a product or a service, they're having trouble figuring out the pricing. And I'm always an advocate that it can't just be on what your competitor it has to be your cost and your overhead as well. So can you talk a little bit about how you set your pricing and any challenges that you've had with setting your pricing? So our pricing right now, we still hear, oh, your price is high. Um, I hear that all the time, but I feel like what we're putting into this box, it, it, one of our biggest competitors is KiwiCo. They mass produce their items. Um, it's a prefabricated product. And don't get me wrong, my younger daughter loves it, um, but it's a very different product. But that is the first thing that comes to people's mind when you say a STEM subscription box is KiwiCo, where you can go on and get them for $19.99 and you'll get your three activities um, where your child will probably blow through all three of them in an hour. Now, when you look at our box, that's not the case at all. You're getting five experiences and you're probably going to do them throughout the month. It's probably, you know, each thing is probably going to take enough time to wear you can spread them out. Um, I would say for pricing for me, especially now, I mean, prices are continuing to go up. The biggest challenge I have is shipping cost. Um, and I think things like Amazon has like ruined us all from like, we're like shipping costs blind or something. <laughs> like that, yeah. you know? Everything ships for free these days when in actuality, it's costing me maybe $12 to ship a box, but who in their right mind is going to pay $12 to ship a box, you know? So we do have a flat rate shipping. Um, some of our items come with free shipping depending on what it is, but shipping is one of the biggest costs that I have to kind of absorb into the actual price because I can see how a $12 price tag on shipping is a big turnoff for people. Um, I'm going to stop you right there because Lauren, I'm wanting you to put this into the chat and I'm going to paraphrase what Michelle just said. Did you notice that Michelle noted that she could not put $12 shipping on the um, marketing on the selling, but she had to absorb it into the cost. I, Michelle, it drives me nuts because people pay for shipping and they don't absorb it in the cost. It becomes an overhead and it starts killing them. And then the more the sales goes up, the more their expenses are going up and they don't realize when it costs you more, you must, okay, here you go, guys, pass the cost on to the customer. Big companies pass it on to the customer before it even affects them. Small companies absorb the cost internally until it kills them. So Lauren, you know, put in there, if it costs you more to create your product or service, including shipping, add it to the price. Michelle, thank you for saying that. I had to drive that home because I see that happening all the time. Please continue. Sorry. I can, I don't know if you can still hear me. There's a, they're doing the lawn. I can go stop. Them yeah, no, you you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I would say on top of that, it was like, okay, uh, a customized box that I mentioned earlier that took me nine months to get. You have to account for all of that. I mean, even shipping on the boxes to get them to me. Again, like talking about how you just said, passing it on down to the customer. So it's not just what's going into the box. It's not just the actual box itself. It's not just the shipping. And then it's my time, right? Um, so that's the toughest part for a creative mind for whether you're a maker, whether you're, you know, you have a business like mine, people undervalue their time for sure. Um, and like I mentioned previously, my competitor, it's a mass produced prefabricated item. That's not what you're getting here. And you just have to make sure that you're conveying that to your customers. You have to show them the value when it comes to the price. That's, that's a fight that I'm currently, you know, I'm, I'm still doing that. It's like, well, you may think my price is maybe $5 too much, but let me tell you about the value that's in it. Um, and you know, that's part of, I guess, the marketing background. Here's that another brilliant thing. Lauren, we got another one. You have to explain the value of your price because that's where people say, okay, somebody produces this cheaper and I got to match them. I'm like, no, Coach Purse doesn't do that. Okay. Is it, you know, dumb example. But you, if you 
if it costs you more to make, then you can effectively sell a selling price at. You either have to stop the company or you have to learn to put the value to the customer so they're willing to pay that amount. So that is another key, key point. You have to make your marketing match your selling price and the selling price is deemed required by your cost of produce and your overhead. So that is the long story short on that one. And Michelle, I'm gonna back you up for a second. Jennifer has a question about what merchant service did you use to process credit cards? I know you probably ran into a whole lot of learning on that aspect. So the let's let's expand on that. The merchant service you use is, and let's give Jennifer a little bit more. Anything else you can say about processing credit cards, challenges, difficulties, and lessons learned on that? Yeah, so with Wix, they are partnered with Stripe. I believe they can accept Square and PayPal. We currently just use Stripe. It's just a straight credit card system. Stripe is a very popular one that works a lot with online uh, retailers. Um, and I honestly, that was one of the easier things for me. It was kind of oh, very good. straightforward. You just put in your bank account information. I think I had to put in some of my personal, like my driver's license or something like that. I don't really remember, but it was pretty straightforward. I didn't really have any issues. Now, because we're not a point of sale, we're not in person. It's really easy because it's just kind of built into the website. Um, I have done pop-up events and live live events, you know, during like the holiday season and sold boxes on on site. And when I do that, I, I typically use Square. It's something that people know and they somewhat trust it and they're familiar with it. Right. Um, but what I what I like about Stripe is that they already partnered with Wix. I didn't have to seek them out. It was kind of like you know here's your options, pick one <laughs> and right. we chose Stripe. So it, that part for me was pretty simple. And then I do have a square that's open um, just in case I ever do in-person events. You know, on that, let's also talk, Michelle, about sales tax. And I'm going to tell you why I bring this. This is a, something I see so many times. It's really a horrific situation. And I, I probably get it two or three times a month. And what happens is people are selling products. They either don't charge sales tax when they need to or and this is even i don't know if it's worse or not both of them are bad but they start charging sales tax without getting a seller's permit i see that all the time and so now you're basically collecting sales tax because you know you need to but you didn't even set up a seller's permit right and then the other thing that i see people fall prey to very badly and i understand why and that is um through Shopify. Now, Shopify may have changed this, guys. I'm not an expert in Shopify, but Shopify has this little button that you can say charge sales tax. And what it's doing is it's adding sales tax to the invoice, but it's not collecting the sales tax and then submitting it to the government agency. It's just letting you collect it. So I see people choose sales tax think it's being handled, not get a seller's permit, that money is physically going into their bank account, which not to be scary, but that's considered fraud, you know, ignorance of the law, that's complete fraud. You're collecting on behalf of people claiming to have, you know, a seller's permit. And I can't tell you how many scary times I, I run into this too often. So I that was the background I wanted to explain to the audience. Does Wix do sales tax? What do you do when you have to do the sales tax with Square? I'm assuming sales tax is a, a major part that you have to make sure you're on top of. Yes, so I do have a seller's permit. Absolutely. Um, I file my quarterly return and I do that myself. It's pretty straightforward for, mm -hmm. for what I do anyways. You know, I'm not in agriculture or tobacco or I don't know all those special categories that they have there. Um, so I do have a seller's permit for Wix. I do have a sales tax on. However, Wix will only collect sales tax in states that have sales tax. So there are states like, I don't know, maybe Nevada, Tennessee, I think, don't quote me on that, but that they don't collect sales tax. Um, so I can't legally collect sales tax from someone in that state because I'm an e-commerce business they're not coming to me locally here in Long Beach, California, I have to abide by their state's rules. 
Um, so, and I'm going to stop and explain a little bit. Hold your thought right there, Michelle. So hold your thought. Don't lose that. So guys, when you're selling into another state, there used to be um, prior to maybe four years ago, five years ago, I can't remember, um, but it used to be what's called Nexus. If I have a headquarter in California, I'm selling out of California. If California charges sales tax, I charge sales tax. Otherwise, I don't. But that has changed. You know, now Amazon charges sales tax on, on um, invoices. And it's because there was a ruling change and it was actually South Dakota um, versus, and I'm trying to, uh, Wayfair, South Dakota versus Wayfair, where it changed, where there's economic nexus, where each state, and this is what I wanna say, each state gets to choose whether or not they want to charge sales tax when you're selling into their state. So now if you're selling into other states, you gotta abide by that state's law. And some states have these laws, Nevada is one of them, I don't remember the exact quantity, but you don't have to charge sales tax until you sold a certain dollar amount. Some of them have the number of transactions if you sold a dollar amount. It, so sales tax in the last four years, especially when you're selling out of your state, is huge complications because you got to know that. So, um, Shopify does give you some indication on it. And that's what Michelle was talking about with whether or not she is liable for sales tax in that specific state. Michelle, elaborate on what I just said, if B, and I didn't mean to ruin your train of thought, but I wanted the audience to understand this, the logistics of sales tax, actually. So, so what makes it easy for me and is that Wix does this for me. That's another reason why I like this platform is because they're tracking how much I'm bringing in I can run an entire report by state and see, you know, how much I brought in per state, whether or not it's charging sales tax, what that sales tax rate is, you know, it's going to be different here in California than somewhere else. Um, so that's another reason why I like this platform. It makes it pretty user friendly. Yep. And keep in mind, guys, if you're, you know, like, just like Michelle says, I have a seller's permit in California, say that I reach the threshold in Nevada or South Dakota has a threshold, other states have thresholds too, then I have to set up a seller's permit in that state. So the same way I get a seller's permit in California, I would have to get a seller's permit in Nevada, I would have to then send the sales tax to Nevada, and I would have to have a document, which what she's saying Wix does, that gives me the zip codes and tells me how much I'm selling. So sales tax, especially if you're selling a product and some services like in South Dakota, services are taxable. In California, some services are taxable, not many, but some are. So I want you guys that offer services out there not to just have a blind eye that this doesn't mean you too, it can. So thank you for that, Michelle, because that's another big issue that people get into. So with our remaining time, I want to um, first say, Michelle, what's next? Where do you see this heading? What do you got on the um, horizon? Um, yeah, 2022 is going to be an exciting year for us. I feel like this is the year where we're going to kind of take things to the next level. We survived this far and now we're ready to, you know, to go. Um, so my plan is to seek out more charter schools this year. Um, I actually have a goal. I want to add, you know, 10 a month for the year. I know that's very ambitious, but hey, you got to set a goal, right? Or otherwise you'll never, you'll never hit that. Um, I do want to add more charter schools in. And I've also, I'm starting to partner with um, an e-commerce. They're actually an expert consulting agency for a few tips on how to optimize, not just SEO and things like that, but the user experience, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm too close to it. And to me, my website's super intuitive. But what's happening is we're getting traffic and we're not getting conversions. So oh. that means that there's a disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. So something's happening to where people are coming to my website, whether it's organically, we do a little bit of paid, not too much, um, but they're not actually pulling out their credit card and making that purchase. So what is that disconnect? And that is a, yeah. something that I'm trying to identify this year and change and fix. Um, and I think um, I really have a good foundation. I have a really good understanding of my audience, but I'm just going to keep finding them. I'm going to, you know, go outside of California. There's got to be, um, mm -hmm. you know, other, other charter schools, districts, wholesale opportunities. Um, I'm looking into all of those things this year. Yeah, that's wonderful. Like you guys had joined with Emma, who Emma's in our uh, watching us right now. Emma talked about how she took her product and then realized that there was a whole world 
not even just a whole country, a whole world. And so once you have something, and given the fact that we have the technology, absolutely can go anywhere from there. So if you um, bring us full circle from that really, really bad day we talked about to today, and, and you were gonna say, you know, what did I learn? And this isn't uh, business, this isn't finance, this isn't any of that stuff. This isn't about credit card processing. This is just, if you were to tell people listening, cause I know we have enough people on the phone that some are on the, the show right now, that some people are feeling or have felt or will feel where you were that day. What can you tell them? I would say that um, it's not easy. I would say that you have to put your pride aside and you have to look at your numbers and that if the worst case scenario happens, as long as you are true to yourself and true to knowing that if what you want to do in life is be an entrepreneur and that is, you know, that that is who you're meant to be, you can't give up. There's always going to be another road. Um, I'm even now, you know, I'm doing these, these STEM boxes. I actually went back to work full time um, and I thought I would never do that, but I'm loving it. Um, you know, I, I still do freelance here, there, it, but my point is that it's never, you're never stuck in that moment, but you have to have the drive to get yourself out of it because nobody else is going to do it for you. If you're lucky enough to meet someone like Lori, that's going to be like your cheerleader. That's amazing. And, you know, Lori got me through some really tough, tough times. Um, but it's, it's having the confidence to say, okay, that's done. Where are we going from here? And it's, it's completely 100% your choice. It, you know, just well said, Michelle, thank you so much for sharing. And you said so many wonderful things that I love. The first one is choice. You know, I always say that choice is my absolute favorite word in the English language. And that's why I'm so adamant about doing financials and understanding where you are, because if you don't, you eliminate your choices, you end up with less choice. And it's so true. Nothing, you know, they say nothing's permanent, everything changes, good times go away and bad times go away. And I know myself, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, you know, for those who are just getting into it, and you think an entrepreneur is just like a, oh, it's great, I'm going to take time off and I'm going to make all that money. Um, maybe, but probably not. Okay. I'll give you the benefit of out. Probably not. Um, but even though I've been on my own um, my whole life, you know what? It's not a bad road to go and it's who I am. And that's what I liked about what you said is, you know, who, who are you? You know, who, who are you and who you're going to be? So we're going to, we got a couple more minutes. I got a couple questions from the audience that I want to throw in here. So when you talked about conversion rates, and I really like that you spoke of it, and I'm glad that Don asked this question because it's something we should go back to. I actually talk about looking at what your efforts are in sales and conversion rates, even if we're not talking about online, even if you're just knocking on doors, what conversion rates are. And I'm real big in them. I actually even do Excel documents to say, how many people would you have to call? How many exposure would you have to get? How this? And I have my way of looking at it, but you have a really good understanding. So Donna's question specifically is, what was the source you mentioned that can help with the conversion rates? But I think let's expand upon Donna's question and even say, what did you find out about conversion rates? What did you say it had to be, you know, any more that you want to add on that? So go ahead, Michelle. Yeah. So from a digital standpoint, conversion rates, I'm so sorry. Um, conversion rates are what I'm looking at is my Google analytics. So if you have a website and you're selling something on a website and you don't have your Google analytics set up, run and do that <laughs> because that's <laughs> going to tell you so much information. It's going to tell you who's clicking where, where it's coming from. It's gonna tell you exactly which page they fall off on. Um, so that's that's how I noticed that, hey, we're getting all this traffic, but nobody's clicking through. Yeah. Um, so number one, Google Analytics is an amazing tool and I'm sure a lot of people know about it, but I think for a long time I had my Google Analytics, but I didn't pay attention to it. So just because you have it, you, you, you gotta pay attention. Um, it's just like those spreadsheets, Lori. To me, to me, <laughs> Google Analytics and spreadsheets are are kind of the same. Yeah. Um, and past that, you know, it's 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 kind of recognizing that there's a problem. You have you have to look at it from an analytical standpoint, and you can't just say, "Well, I'm doing great. I have all this website traffic," but if you're not getting sales, then there's a problem, right? 
Yeah. If you can't buy a quart of milk, remember my famous saying, yeah. you know, I say that all the time. It's great if everybody, you know, I always say, you know, that old country song, if I have a dollar for every song I sang, I used to say, if I had a dollar for every like, you know, I could buy a quart of milk, but likes don't buy a quart of milk and people coming to your website, don't buy a quart right. of milk. Conversions right. and them getting out the credit card buy yes. a quart of milk and that's that's all on that one yeah absolutely so before we end the show i got some um questions in the q a that i'm just going to address slightly um so the first one is anonymous with, who talked about opening the llc your question's real involved and it might be great if you reach out to the sbdc and get a one-on-one -on -one for that because i can tell from your question where you are and you are definitely need more assistance than can just be given on a show. So I'm going to say respectfully anonymous, get Lauren's email in the um, chat, send an email to Lauren. And by the way, guys, I don't think we mentioned this. If you are not an SBDC client and you sign up, and you want to meet with me, send the email to Lauren and give your name. That way I know so I can make sure that arrangement took place, okay? And Tova, um, you've got some great questions about the four basic questions from next week as far as service and billable time. Going to fully get into that next week. So you're going to have to come back next week, and we're going to go through that in detail. So go ahead and take that question, copy it. Keep it in your file and post that one next week. I'm going to address that one. And if anybody else had any other questions that were put in the chat that I missed, I'll see it when I review the, the chat the next time, okay? Um, and there was one more question from Donna on sales bonds. So you're going to have to be a little bit more specific what you're needing. And I'm assuming you're selling a certain amount that they've requested the bond, who requested the bond, et cetera. So Donna, once again, either get Lauren's email and send me that question with a little bit more detail or just post it next week when we got just more of an open forum. So I think I took care of anything that I saw in the Q&A. If anybody got missed because you put it in the chat, we'll, we'll catch up next week. So right now I want to say, Michelle, thank you. Your story was fascinating. It was inspiring. And also it gave so much information from financial to logistics, to product creation, to sales tax, to shipping. I mean, you probably didn't even realize all the things we talked about today. So I appreciate it. The audience appreciates it. Thank you for being here. Lauren, we're going to send it back to you so you can wrap it up for all of us. Thanks, Lori. Lori, I was answering one more question. I was trying to get... <laughs> probably were I like I said you are the the you know with Oz and the little wizard behind doing all this stuff when Toto removed the curtain that's Lauren behind the scenes I'm just doing my thing and Lauren's back there doing all this and I do look at the chat every once in a while and then I go oh wait there's too much going on I can't even pick anything out of that I know she's got it under control <laughs> I try my best to keep up this was such a good show Michelle thank you again thank you so much and Lori of course always thank you there's so much insight um just love hearing all the stories and what everyone has to say especially to hear uh, Michelle's journey so thank you both uh as Lori mentioned I have um sorry a, still a COVID world <laughs> That would be my 19 month old trying to get a snack. Sorry about that, guys. No um, worries, I had a kid jump in my arms during it. So, hey, we, we're all together in one big happy family here. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to include a link to our um, YouTube channel so that everyone can see previous recordings. This recording from today will be going up uh, later on today, as soon as I have the video that I can snag from Zoom. And then for those of you who would like to submit a show suggestion, or if you would like to be on our show, I'll have a link to that as well. And then as Lori mentioned, if you are not an SBDC client, I'll help include a link very quickly. Uh, very shortly uh, for you to sign up as a new client, but please be sure to send me an email. My email is lsimpson at lbcc.edu, but of course I'll add that to our chat. Um, I think I've, I think I've said it all. Thank you again, both of you ladies. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Good seeing you again. Much success. And you know, we're, we may invite you back to share more on social media and all that, because that's a big question. So we, if we get a lot of requests for social media, Michelle, we might come back and, you know, that awful saying that people say, pick your brain a little bit more on that one. <laughs> I'm totally up for it. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> then, then we'll, con we'll consider that a plan, guys. Okay, I will see you next week. We're going to get into the weeds with some financial stuff. I'm going to tell you more about what you need to know be there next week to make sure that you can manage your company financially sound i'm out of here lauren will stay back a little bit like she always does i will see everybody next week bye everybody bye michelle bye bye, bye everyone thank you thank you thank you and for those of you who are hanging out i'm going to re-input links to our youtube as well as to our submission page as well as to um uh, my email of course so hold tight for me and i'll add that and thank you again we'll see you next week Okay, I've included all the links again, and I've also included my email address. Thank you again to all of you who have joined us, and we'll see you next week at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Bye.